What it takes to have a fossil, whether it's a dinosaur fossil or a petrified wood or anything like this, we've got to have some cataclysmic event that has not only killed that animal, but buried it under tons of gravel or volcanic ash or dirt in some landslide. The very mechanism that causes and creates fossils is the same mechanism that causes the extinction of these animals. And that is cataclysmic changes. So as we look at fossils, we start to see that they themselves are indicative of these cataclysms of the past. And now we can also begin to look at geological dating in a different way. On the face of it, um, an artifact, a human artifact, found in a layer of rock which seems to be millions of years old is an inexplicable anomaly. It's not so inexplicable if the strata isn't millions of years old and if the dating method that's being used is in fact inaccurate. And I suspect that in many cases that's exactly what has happened in recent years. The chief radioactive dating method that's used to date the Earth is the uranium lead method. Uranium radioactive mineral turns into lead over a long, long period of time. You measure the amount of uranium in the Earth's crust, you measure the amount of lead. That tells you, or that at least conventional scientists say, that tells you how old the Earth is. Now, the figure that you arrive at when you use that technique is 4,500 million years. However, what they haven't mentioned is that uranium also turns into another substance. It turns into a distinctive form of helium, radioactive helium. In fact, practically all the radioactive helium in the Earth's atmosphere has come from radioactive decay. Now, if this method was reliable, if you measured the age of the helium in the atmosphere, it would give you the same age, 4,500 billion years. In fact, it doesn't give you an age anything like that. It gives you an age just a couple of hundred thousand years. Now, it seems to me that any technique for dating, which on one hand gives you an age of four and a half billion years, but on the other hand gives you an age of just a couple of hundred thousand years, that technique has to be at least very unreliable. The dating anomalies and the evidence which contradicts uh, the reliability of dating is being ignored by scientists on the whole because they'd have to restructure their whole theory of the age of the Earth. It would mean really starting from scratch. For example, the rate at which coal is formed is still controversial. The conventional idea is that coal is formed very slowly over millions of years and that basically it's age that determines the formation of coal. In fact, there's quite a bit of evidence in the field that coal might be produced from wood by pressure alone. For example, uh, modern timber pilings of bridges have turned into a, a low rank of coal. Um, the Ohio, Ohio coal seam in the United States, the rank of the coal increases as, you get, as the coal goes further and further underground, as the pressure increases. So it seems that there is some evidence that pressure alone might generate coal in a relatively short space of time. Now, if coal can be produced relatively rapidly, what about the other rocks of the Earth's crust? Perhaps they could be formed relatively rapidly as well. This is complete heresy. This is one thing that orthodox geologists would not accept. And yet there is mounting evidence that some types of rock can be formed very quickly in catastrophic conditions. The rocks behind me are thought to be 65 million years old, and they're thought to have been formed by processes that work very, very slowly over immense periods of time. But they could equally have been formed relatively rapidly by cataclysmic processes. Darwinists prefer the first interpretation because it's consistent with their interpretation of immense antiquity for life on Earth. The Earth could conceivably be younger than the four and a half billion years that it's customarily taken to be. And if that's the case, then there has been much less time available for life to evolve on Earth. And the Darwinian mechanism, which requires billions of years to work, is looking far less probable. The theory of evolution is so popular today that few dare to question it. In one sense, you can understand people's reluctance to drop Darwinism because apart from the fact that it's an attractive theory, there is also a scientific principle. It's called the principle of tenacity, that you shouldn't junk ideas just because a few anomalies have come along. The trouble is that the anomalies with Darwinism are so enormous that they're now greater than the theory itself. And so we should start questioning this principle of tenacity. We should start questioning should we be hanging on to this theory regardless? The key problems with Darwin's theory are that, quite simply, 
there isn't any really solid empirical evidence. It's conjecture on conjecture, supposition on supposition. They're all very plausible, they're very rational suppositions, very rational conjectures, but they are still conjectures. And I find it ironic that for most of this century, Darwinists have acted and spoken as if they had already delivered conclusive proof to us of their theory. Well, in fact, that's the last thing they've done. There is no conclusive evidence of Darwinism. The evidence seems solid, but as soon as you start to investigate it, it just melts away. Probably the most famous example is the, the, the peppered moth. This is a light-colored moth which uh, lives in the northern counties of England. And between the years 1850 and 1900, when the trees were darkened by atmospheric pollution from factory chimneys, the moth changed from a light gray color to a dark gray color so that it could remain camouflaged on the tree trunks because the birds eat the moth. Well, this was described, this process, it's even been given a, a name by Darwin, it's called industrial melanism. And it was described by the director of the Natural History Museum, Sir Gavin de Beer, as being an example of evolution and even of natural, history, natural selection taking place in man's lifetime. And obviously, if that were true, it would be very powerful evidence. Well, when you look at the peppered moth, you don't need to be a scientist to be able to see that what's happened is that originally you had a lot of light-colored moths and a few dark-colored moths, that the light-colored moths have died off because the trees have turned dark, and that the dark-colored moths have flourished at their expense. Now, if Darwinists want to call that natural selection, they're entitled to do so. But nobody could possibly believe that that is a mechanism that could explain how one species could turn into another species, and that is what evolution is all about not about moths changing colour. One of the fundamental premises of Darwin's theory is that a species can, if it evolves long enough, turn into another species. Now this central idea is contradicted by every single plant and animal breeding experiment of the last 500 years. Every animal and plant breeder knows that there is a limit to the extent to which an animal or a plant can be changed. Ultimately, the line becomes sterile or it simply reverts to the original type from which you've selected. This has even been given a name. Ernst Mayer, professor of zoology at Harvard, called it genetic homeostasis. And that simply means that there is a barrier beyond which evolution cannot pass. I find it extraordinary that the world's biologists continue to believe in the infinite plasticity of individuals when they know perfectly well that experiments show that it simply can't happen. In the first edition of his book, On the Origin of Species, Charles Darwin made a very interesting observation. He said that he could see no difficulty in a race of bears taking to the water, becoming aquatic, and eventually becoming a creature, as he said, as monstrous as a whale. So there you have the idea, bears can turn into whales just given enough time and enough natural selection. Now, in later editions of his book, Darwin removed that claim. He'd obviously thought better of it and realized it couldn't be substantiated with evidence, so he thought he'd better not press it. But the interesting thing about him removing that is that the idea that a bear can turn into a whale through natural selection is the very core idea of Darwinism. It's the, it's the top and bottom of the Darwinian theory that one species can turn into another species. And in removing that example, I can't help feeling that Darwin must have had grave reservations about the rest of his theory. The whole Earth's surface is covered with sedimentary rocks, and in those rocks there are fossils. It ought to be possible to go to those rocks and to find a sequence of fossils, one species turning into another species, turning into another species. In fact, it ought to be possible for the kids at the local kindergarten to do this on an afternoon's nature study at the local quarry. But the world's greatest paleontologists, with the resources of the world's greatest universities at their disposal, have failed to do this. And they've been looking for more than 100 years. The theory of man's rise to civilization is as mysterious as his origins. Ancient monuments around the world were built with such sophistication that they can hardly be duplicated today. Yet scientists continue to belittle these remarkable achievements. I wrote Fingerprints of the Gods because I wasn't satisfied with the answers that were being given to me to a huge series of mysteries around this planet. Most mysterious of all, a series of ancient sites uh, that have never been properly explained by historians. These sites I think of literally as the fingerprints of the gods, as marks left on our planet by a lost civilization that we have not yet properly identified. And amongst those sites, two in particular 
are extremely interesting. One 